Hi guys, welcome to another Revitalization Blueprint podcast. I'm here with a very special guest who is a former undercover cop, Scotland Yard detective, author, and the guy that takes charge on Hunted. And you may have noticed him taking hostage a grown man's teddy bear on the last season. All is fair in love and hunted. Did he get it back? Of course he did, unharmed, safely returned to its owner. But that little scam did the trick. It was quite worrying how uh, how attached he was to it. Well, you see, the whole reason that we do social media uh, videos when fugitives are on the run is because we're trying to get under their skin. Yeah. We're trying to prompt them into some kind of reaction. Hopefully a reaction whereby they will utilise a device. So we might pick up on an IP address and therefore get a location and we can pick up that investigative thread once again. But with Chris and Kem, when they were on the run for Celebrity Hunted and we took Kem's giant teddy bear and I did that little video with him, um, that did prompt them into a reaction, but their reaction was to go into a radio station and, yeah. do, and, and do a live broadcast. So it served its purpose. That gave us a thread on which to pick up the investigation, CCTV from that building, blah, blah, blah. And of course, it finally led to their capture. So that was an extremely successful tactic. It was a very good tactic. And guys, this is Peter Blexey. Thank you for joining me. I didn't even put your name in there. Tell us a little bit more. We mentioned about former undercover cop. This was back in the day, getting into the police force wasn't exactly from what I could make of it, wasn't to say, hey, I want to get in the police force. It was your mum kind of throwing you in at the deep end as such. Well, I, I, was, um, I was an errant youth, unfortunately. I was, uh, I was a product of a, a single parent family. My uh, violent and uh, an alcoholic father left when I was probably around 11 years old. Um, I lost my granddad not long after that. And so I didn't have any male role models in life, really. And I just became a blooming nuisance to be perfectly honest with you um, despite my wonderful mum's best efforts to keep me on the straight and narrow once she disappeared off out the door for work she didn't have a clue what I was getting up to um, until one day I returned home from yet another fishing trip and um, to my horror there was an enormous police officer sitting in the lounge of the flat that I shared with my mum and of course, my first thoughts were, what am I going to get nicked for? Yeah. Um, fortunately, he wasn't there to arrest me. He was there to give me a bit of a talking to and sell the idea of joining the police to me. He did a very good job. I uh, filled out the application forms very soon afterwards and within a matter of months, with a pretty considerable haircut, I was walking through the gates of Hendon Police College. Nice. And did your views of the police change from before that conversation to afterwards? Yeah, well, I've never been particularly anti-police kind of thing. You know, I'd done some pretty unforgivable things to them at football matches and that kind of stuff, but I wouldn't have regarded myself as a an anti-police radical um, or else I clearly wouldn't have joined. Um, but having been a complete nuisance at school, and an absolute pain for the teachers, and I apologise to anybody in the teaching profession. At least I've raised three kids now with my wife who uh, who are good pupils, two of them still at school, you know, and do behave themselves and do value education. All my kids have done. Um, when, so so when I when I suddenly went from that school environment, which I left at, left at 16, with very few qualifications, when I walked through the, the doors of, of the cadet school at Hendon, all of a sudden, instead of teachers that I disrespected and run, run ragged, there were former Royal Marines mm -hmm. who, when they said, Blexley, get down for 10 press-ups, the option to say, or oh, what, didn't really exist, you know, because the or oh, what would have been unthinkable. They'd have turned you into a crowd in the blink of an eye, you know. Yeah. So, um, so... I suddenly relished that discipline. It was what I needed. I needed to grow up. I needed to mature. I needed to, uh, you know, get fit and, and finally sort of find some respect for a body or an organisation that I was a part of. Are the police cadets still run that way where you go and... No, sadly not. Sadly not. It used to be a full-time, 
you know, residential kind of yeah, set up. Like army similar to that sort yeah, of Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's nothing like that now, I'm afraid. No, that probably explains some of the some of the changes that have gone on in there. Um, well, the other, the, the, the disappointing thing I think is, is that it gave kids like me, who essentially probably in my core was a good kid, mm -hmm. but wrapped up in a bad exterior, it gave me the opportunity to join public service, contribute something to public service instead of perhaps going further down the, the wrong route that I'd already taken a few strides down. Yeah, and also without going into the military side as well, like it's still been able to serve your country in a different way as well. Yeah, I had originally been interested in joining the military, um, but my mum was less keen on that and more keen on the policing side of things, hence she got that cop around to my flat one day. And how did it go from being on the beat to actually getting to undercover? Um, well, it wasn't a very scientific process being recruited for undercover work in those days. What actually happened was I worked in uniform at Peckham in South East London. And if I thought I'd been Jack the Lad in Bexley Heath, well, when I got to Peckham, I met some properly, properly serious Jack the Lads that made me look like a marshmallow. Um, and it was a real eye opener. It was a very challenging area to police. There was a lot of uh, racial tension. The police force back in the day, and I'm talking the late 70s, early 80s, was largely a racist organisation, I'm ashamed to say. Um, but Peckham kept me very busy as a PC with an awful lot of crime. Um, not long after, well, about four years after being posted to Peckham, I suddenly decided that um, I didn't want to wear the uniform anymore. I'd gone to the Brixton riots and I'd had bricks and bottles and petrol bombs and all that slung at me for a, for a very long, challenging weekend. And I decided that I didn't want to be that symbol of oppression and repression and mm -hmm. all the disquiet between uh, the, the public and I. So I got out of uniform, then became a detective and then got posted to Kensington Police Station okay. as, a, as an established DC, uh, Detective Constable. It's a bit of a contrast between Peckham to Kensington. Huge contrast, massive. You know, suddenly in the royal borough of Kensington and Chelsea, don't you know? Yeah. You know, there was all these people with loads of money, different kind of criminal landscape, albeit there was still plenty of crime. Yeah. Um, and I worked there, and as my time at Kensington came to a close, obviously the next natural progression for me was to become a Scotland Yard detective. That's what I wanted to do. That was the ambition. And um, I didn't go down the flying squad route, which a lot of my colleagues wanted to do, because at the time the Sweeney was on TV and that was seen as a very um, kind of um, high status squad to go on. But now we're talking about the mid 1980s. Ronald Reagan on the other side of the pond is banging on about the war on drugs. Working in Kensington, I'd seen the explosion of cocaine onto the streets of London. The rave scene was just in its infancy with ecstasy and all of yeah. that. And I was thinking, you know, working in the drugs arena has got to be the place to be. There'll be more resources. The spotlight will be on it. That's where I want to go. So I was fortunate enough to be accepted, got on there. And then not long after being there, I went on my first undercover operation but not working undercover okay i was one of the arrest team okay so the guys that would be there ready to to swoop in absolutely ready to pounce and we were hidden on the top deck of a double decker bus which we'd hired for the day lying on the floor so nobody could see us the the deal was supposed to be going down in a car park next to us it was actually the car park of regent's park zoo london zoo um, but what happened was that the drug deal didn't go down as had been planned. In fact, the bad guys robbed the undercover cops of 70 grand of the commissioner's money. Sprayed ammonia in one of the cops' face, pulled guns, grabbed the hold all full of cash out of the boot of the car and legged it. At which point we all scrambled out of the bus. I chased one of the guys with a gun, um, took him down, he got nicked. Uh, it took a bit longer to, uh, to nick some of the others, but for what seemed like an eternity, the 70 grand of the commissioner's money disappeared. 
Um, it was later found under a tarpaulin in a skip within the confines of the zoo. So what one of the bad guys had done was he'd snatched the 70 grand, legged it into the zoo, hidden it in a skip as he thought okay. probably to return at some stage and get it back. But um, So as the detective inspector who was in charge of that operation that day said at the debriefing, he said, today I discovered that adrenaline runs down your leg. Because... <laughs> Because he had potentially seen his career b being torn to shreds, but uh, it didn't. But so, you know, I kind of saw all that had gone on that day. And I said to myself, next time an undercover job comes in, um, I'm going to volunteer for that because they ain't going to rob me. It's quite a, when you describe it as the adrenaline running down your leg, when was the first time, not that you pissed yourself, but... When you felt that feel of adrenaline, when you think, hang on, I need to do something here. If not, my life is going to just depend on it. Policing, in all its guises, in most of its guises, is a, ven is a very adrenaline fueled kind of occupation. Yep. The ladies and gentlemen who perform response duties, who drive those cars that we see with flashing blue lights and sirens so often. You know, they're in a very adrenaline fueled atmosphere. They never know what they're going into. They never know what's behind that door. They, they, they very rarely know what any person might be carrying on them or might produce at some moment. So, you know, policing across its really broad spectrum of all the different things you can do has a lot of adrenaline, threat, excitement and all of that. And throughout my police career, I'd experienced all of that. And I had, quite frankly, especially when I started working undercover, I just became an adrenaline junkie. And was there a time when, well, I'm assuming there was plenty of times when there were, you're thinking, shit, my life's on the line here. Um, there was one talk, I, I think you mentioned about being stabbed in the neck in the book that's having a shotgun in your face. Yeah. What is the one moment that stands out more than any? There, there, yeah, there were many, many occasions. I still carry the faded scar of when I got stabbed in the neck. And yes, you're absolutely right. I stared down the barrel of a sawn-off shotgun and other guns on other occasions and had quite a few lucky scrapes. Um, but oh, I was a lot younger than I am now. Um, I had all that enthusiasm and energy for the job. I was frankly fearless. You know, I, I, I feared nothing and no one. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't have repeatedly gone into the lion's den again and again and again. Um, but I think as for any one specific time, it was probably when I wasn't working undercover, when we were searching for a man who'd been convicted of murder but had escaped from a high security prison in Scotland um, to, to try and shorten this otherwise rather lengthy story. Uh, we searched the flat where we thought he might have been living in London and there was an empty bed there and his flatmate told, told us a, a web of lies. As we came out of the flat, I've always been inquisitive and nosy and that's a, that's a good trait for a detective. I came out, I'd heard somewhere along the line that he may have been working as a builder whilst this fugitive was on the run. I saw a builder's van over the road and I thought, right, I'm gonna go and have a look. You know, I was carrying a gun at the time. You know, I'd obviously drawn my weapon when we'd done the search of the flat and what have you, but it was shoulder holstered back up. I go over, over to this van. Meanwhile, my colleagues are discussing the really serious business of the day, which was where are we gonna go and have breakfast, right? And there's kind of like behind me. And um, so I look around this van, you know, do the obvious things, check the tax disc as cars had in those days, have a nose around. And I could see that behind the, the front portion where the driver and passenger seats were, there was a partition um, and I couldn't clearly see into the back portion. So I went round to the back door, stuck my hand on it and lo and behold, it was open. So I thought, right, okay, as you do, I'm gonna have a nose into it, open the door, move in and literally as I've kind of got my upper body into the van to start clambering into it, 
all of a sudden, a head pops up from beneath a blanket. And I've gone, oh, and I was so taken aback, and I've had a lot of ribbing from colleagues over the years. I turned around and said, good morning. But then, you know, the training kicked in because I immediately went into, I'm an armed police officer. So that was just instinct. I didn't have time to think what I was going to say to him next. But literally, as I said that, he reached to his side and went wallop. And there it was in front of me, literally inches from the end of my nose, a double-barreled, sawn off, up and over shotgun. At which point I thought, right, what do I do? Do I reach into my shoulder holster, pull my weapon? No, no, absolutely not. In that, in that split second, I was thinking, that is just going to waste too much time. He's going to kill me. Yeah. You know, he, he, clearly, because all he's got to do is pull the trigger. So I just legged it. You know, in the finest traditions of Metropolitan Police bravery, I legged it as fast as my legs would carry me. All the while, I'm shouting at my colleagues, he's got an effing gun, he's got a gun, you know, because I wanted them to take cover and all that kind of stuff. So in that split second, um, I was extremely lucky that for some reason or other, he didn't pull the trigger. And the story has a bit of a sad ending because there was then a siege that lasted for a couple of days and in the end he ended up taking his own life with a shotgun instead of shooting me he stuck it in his mouth and and that was the end of him so that was probably you know despite being stabbed in the neck and despite being stuck up against toilet walls and search and despite being threatened with guns on other occasions i think that moment there for some reason um uh, he, that trigger didn't get pulled, uh, whether he was surprised or, or, or whatever it was, whether he was trying to process the information that he was receiving. But I think that was possibly the closest I got to not being here talking to you, but to have a little stone memorial in Earl's Court, which I'm very grateful there isn't one there. Definitely, definitely. And also, you mentioned not being fearful, not having fear. Do you think that would have been different if your kids were around back then? Well, I don't, I don't well, know. Like, I, you don't know the answer, but no, it's 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 difficult, isn't it? You know, my my first son was born out of wedlock when I was twenty eight, so I was kind of at the peak of my undercover um, career at the time. And bearing in mind he lived most of the time with his mum, but I was still full time involved. Um, both emotionally and practically as much as I could be, um, that that kind of didn't alter me one bit. I was on a mission, and of course, by the time my younger two sons were born, I'd left the cops. Yeah. Um, so, so it's probably a rather difficult one to answer, even with the benefit of hindsight. I suppose there's also there's the training which is built up inside you, and if you are fearful because you might not be there for them then you're taking your eye off, off the goal off the ball and you're not going to put in 100% into that that case there and then yeah yeah work working undercover required complete focus and concentration on the job in hand and you couldn't afford to, to have uh, any significant distractions so when going undercover were there were times when you had to take drugs and had to be literally I think you mentioned you lived more of your life as a gangster than an actual cop, it, it seemed, just the amount of times undercover. What sort of things were you getting up to when you were up there? It was a, it was a pretty tough world in which I lived such a large part of my life. I was dealing with career criminals day in, day out, and they, I had to convince them I had to act, walk and talk in a way that convinced them that I was one of them, as opposed to somebody who'd ditched his warrant card a few hours and left earlier and left it at New Scotland Yard um, and was a cop trying to walk a straight a situation and guide circumstances into a position whereby the contraband, be it drugs, guns, counterfeit currency, antiques, stolen lorry loads, whatever it might be, so that the contraband could be seized, I could escape, generally speaking, and the bad guys could be arrested. So when you're working undercover, you've got so much going on in your head as to the, you know, that, that situation you are trying to bring around. Um, it was um, 
it was a very, very challenging, challenging role. But yeah, I was young and fearless and frankly loved it. Did you not ever worry, there was one in your actual autobiography with the book, talking about when you were doing the exchange and you were having to test the cocaine and put it on your gums to see if it was yeah. right. When you're taking drugs or getting pissed with the guys that you think, hang on, I might just let it slip here just by being under the influence. And you never not think about that. Which is why getting drunk and taking drugs in the company of villains that you're negotiating with is not a very good idea. No. Okay, it really isn't. And so I would keep that to the absolute minimum. Okay. Whenever I could. I wasn't just going out there and getting off my nut and having a jolly. I would only ever take drugs if I was absolutely forced into a corner and I felt that if I didn't, it was going to be a deal breaker. Um, you know, and that would allow the villains to carry on with their criminality and it would frustrate us. So it certainly wasn't, you know, my default position to have a drink or start taking drugs with them, on the contrary, on the contrary. But there were occasions when it did become absolutely necessary. Yet again, I would try and mitigate things as much as I could. If I was sitting in a flat with a load of criminals and we're negotiating a, uh, a deal of whatever description it was, and the cannabis comes out and, you know, a joint's going to get handed around. Well, what I would do is then say, uh, I'll put that joint together, right? And so I'd get hold of the skins, the, the, the papers, or I might have some myself, and I'd build a very elaborate kind of joint. And what I would deliberately do is I would backload the joint. So, so that means I would put the cannabis towards the end where the roach or the filter was. Right? And that would mean, and what I would then say is after I've built this elaborate three skin or five skin or whatever it was, I'd then spark it up and I'd say, well, I built this, so I'm going to start, I'm going to start it. So I would light and smoke, <coughs> excuse me, I would light and smoke the end where I deliberately have not put cannabis and it's just tobacco. And then I go, right, I've had a couple of bangs on that, over to you, buddy. Um, once again, all trying to mitigate the fact that I didn't want to sit there, you know, getting stoned and end up talking complete nonsense um, whilst I'm in the company of some potentially rather dangerous people. You can imagine, yeah, and a lot of it, as you, well, in fact, most of it was born about with informants and your views on informants, they had, they, you needed them to do your undercover work? Yeah, of course. But what were your personal views, your opinions on them? Yeah, look, you know, policing to this day relies so heavily upon informants, whether that just be a member of the public that receives one snippet of information that they want to pass on, or whether it is some of the kind of informants that I dealt with that were career criminals, but also got paid tens upon tens of thousands of pounds out of police funds for giving information about fellow criminals. They were our lifeblood um, because they are so often privy to information that the police just ain't going to get any other way. So they were vital and I'm sure they remain a vital part of policing to this day. Well, we know that because stats are published every now and again about how much has been paid out to them. Um, yeah, so they're vitally important, but, you know, they are what they are. They're grasses. And, um, and I was always very grateful to, to know that I didn't have any people such as those within my social circle. Yeah, cause it, it does surprise me, even looking at Hunted, and you see someone who's supposed to be a close friend or they're a relative, and suddenly you put a couple hundred quid in front of them, and they're like, oh, they're there. And just, they suddenly flip, even on the ones that aren't celebrity ones, and they're potentially due to win a big cash sum. Yeah, I mean, as for people's motivations, certainly if I uh, if I talk about informants, you know, when I was in the cops, for example, then their motivation was often monetary. Sometimes they wanted to take out the opposition, you know, that were competing in the same marketplace as them. Sometimes it was revenge. There'd be a number of motiv motives for it. Um, but then when we flip to something entirely different 
with some similarities, like hunted, yeah, members of the public do ring up and give us uh, tips and all that kind of stuff. Gives us give us bits of information or intelligence on fugitives, um, which is always very welcome, and they do get a handsome cash reward. So people, it's you know, good job we're not all the same, isn't it? Yeah, it's funny when we watch hunted because me me and Laura watch it and. Sometimes you actually think, hang on, I'm rooting for the bad guys here some of the time. And then you think, well, not when it was a celebrity one. And then Chris and Ken are like, oh, I really hope they get them. But I think there was some, was it last year the guy was autistic that won it? Is he autistic? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And you think but, it's really going to do a lot for his confidence to get past it. And then some of the guys you think, they're just arrogant. That's, I really hope they get it. I think that's the beauty of the show in, in, in many regards, that it can be something that you can flop from one side to the other. Yeah. Um, whether you want us to catch them or whether you root for a particular fugitive that you want to evade capture and all of that. But I do have to remind you and all and sundry, we're the good guys, right? We want to catch them. And we always set out with the object of trying to catch them all. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, they all need catching those pesky fugitives. Well, the thing that comes up is that there's so much technology out there with surveillance nowadays. And then we see what's available and it's actually quite scary to think, hang on, we're always being watched. But unless you are actually on the wrong side of the law, there shouldn't really be anything to worry about. It's surprising how much from maybe the first season to or series to, was it the third season just been? Yeah, second the main, second yeah. celebrity. Yeah, second celebrity. But how much it's changed now, even yeah. with technology in the car where it's just like, not even like the number plate things, just seeing where the car is. Yeah, telematics, yeah, yeah. which are now compulsory on all new vehicles yeah. since earlier on this year. Um, yeah, technology gallops on at a pace and consequently we sometimes get new tactics and powers and resources that we can use on Hunted just to reflect the reality of it all. Um, I'm not particularly of that technological generation I do embrace it and I need to have a handle on it and all of that obviously for the for the show and 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 date the day life but the landscape has changed so completely and that was part of my thinking really uh, particularly with regards to technology and science that drove me down the route of researching and writing about unsolved murders that was one of the main drivers for me doing that that was one of the big ones because the the book to catch a killer that was the alistair wilson was that 2004 yeah it was yeah. like anniversary last week i think was it 28 it was it was a 14th anniversary yeah. Yeah. yeah and you look at the technology that's changed then just 2004 to to now um is there not ever like the evidence kind of like goes off or anything like that well let me let me just rewind a little bit, if I may. Around yeah. about the time of Alastair's murder, um, I had, because I'd, I'd worked on murder cases as a detective, not a raft of them, but a few, and we'd solved every one. So I'd been retired from the police. My autobiography, The Gangbuster, had come out. I'd worked as a drama consultant on a TV show. So that had all kind of gone okay. But then... I, I became more and more fascinated about the fact that it was the 21st century and detectives had so many more tools at their disposal that we simply just never had. Mm -hmm. For example, the explosion of CCTV, which was an or originally conceived as a drug, as a, as, a, as a crime prevention thing, but has now become more of a crime detection tool. So all of a sudden, I was thinking, detectives now have tools at their disposal that I and my colleagues, when we investigated murders, simply didn't have. For example, CCTV, the explosion of that, the length and breadth of the country. Um, mobile phone technology, which can place a person at a particular place and time Forensic science, in all its guises, had just galloped on enormously. 
you know, back in my day, if we had a fingerprint, we'd be lucky. But now, with DNA, blood spatter analysis, the forensic science around fibres and fibre transfers, and, and just everything, just everything to do with DNA, is just unrecognisable from my day. And yet, what was happening was that people were committing murder and getting away with it. So I was thinking, how can that be the case in the 21st century? And that's what has driven my passion and some might say my obsession with certain unsolved murders from that day right up until now and off into the future. But the big thing that kind of it must frustrate you because it frustrated me just reading the book is the way the police force have now acted given that you're no longer an active um, detective in the in the force when you're giving them this information it's kind of like they're like just like no we're not going to accept that we're going to try and get it for ourselves even though we just give them such great information well I, I you know if, if you're going to do what I do which is research and write books about unsolved murders you need to grow a very thick skin because certain people and particularly certain police forces will effectively slam the door in your face okay so be it if you take the case of my most recent book to catch a killer the Alistair Wilson murder um, his wife Veronica wouldn't speak to me. The bank that he worked for wouldn't <clears throat> speak to me. And the police refused to answer my questions. Even questions as bland and inoffensive as is there still a reward on offer, right? That's how ludicrous it was. So any sane writer would clearly have moved on to a different project being given those three insurmountable obstacles. Well, to me, they were just red rags to a very determined bull. And I've continued to research that case. And I will not rest until either I gasp my last or somebody gets convicted of the crime. That's a given. Um, but yeah, it's frustrating when police forces don't want to talk to you, don't want to engage with you. But they're actually missing a trick. And I'll tell you the biggest trick they're missing out on with a lot of crimes, the police know who's done it, but they can't prove it. Yeah. Because there's a big difference between knowing something and proving something, especially in a criminal court of law. You know, you have to prove it so that the jury are sure. Right. Well, if we rewind many years, the Daily Mail, which is far from my favorite newspaper, but once upon a time, they put the picture of a number of men on their front page who the paper accused of murdering Stephen Lawrence, young black teenager murdered not, not so far away from here. And they said, basically the newspaper said, these people did it, now you sue us if you dare. That was the message they were sending out to the people they accused. And of course, many years later, two of them got convicted of that crime. And the reason the paper, I think, in part were able to do that was because if you sue somebody, the balance of proof is lower than that required in a criminal court. Okay, In a civil court, it's kind of on a balance of probabilities. Okay. Whereas in a criminal court, it's so that a jury is sure or beyond reasonable doubt, as people used to say. So it's a different level of proof. Now, I, in one of my previous books, accused a man of murder, stood there in a pub car park and said to him, you shot him, didn't you? Right? About a, a case up in Manchester. And the bloke laughed at me, you know, which I frankly took as a yes. But all that went in the book. You know, I was kind of saying, yeah, if you want to sue me, then sue me. Because, you know, the information I'd gathered, the intelligence picture that I'd been able to build up, I felt would show on a balance of probabilities that it was more likely that he had been the killer than, than he wasn't. So likewise, in a book, I could do that. If a police force wanted to speak to me and they said, OK, we actually strongly, strongly suspect this person of being the murderer. 
okay, and there is this amount of information or intelligence to support that theory, but we can't charge them because we don't have enough evidence. Mm -hmm. I could write a book and I could name a person as a murderer, okay, and throw down the gauntlet and say, right, sue me if you dare, as long as my publisher's lawyers were happy with it and the publisher and all that kind of stuff, yeah. obviously, right? So then that may encourage somebody, a member of the public, when they read that book, they will go, finally, the truth is out there. I am no, now going to tell the police what I know. And what they know could be the crucial piece of information, intelligence or evidence that leads to that person getting charged and going before a court. And that is what a, a senior officer who's just recently retired was saying to me the other day, he said, I don't understand the police's attitude towards you. No. I really don't because it seems like everybody is getting shortchanged here. You know, nobody is benefiting. Whereas if they were going to sit down and have a conversation, and I'm not saying I want to behave inappropriately or get state secrets perhaps that I might not have. But you know what? Some, a few years ago when I was writing um, On The Run, I went to, uh, to meet uh, a senior investigating officer and he opened his doors, put the kettle on, made me very welcome. And at one point he went, Peter, I'm just going to the bathroom now. I may be a while. And he just put his hand on a file and pushed it in my direction. And I thought, okay, fine. Thank you, right? Needless to say, the minute he was out the door, thumb through, thumb through, thumb through, thumb through, and consequently, some villains that couldn't be convicted of a crime got a hard time. So some kind of, you know, there was there was some, some good came out of it, and I ended up having a villain on the phone to me um, earlier on in the year before On The Run came out threatening me with all manner of things, saying that I couldn't publish and I couldn't publish this and I couldn't publish that. And he was really, really stressed out over it. And I thought, good, serves you right. And needless to say, my book went unaltered as a result of that phone call or phone calls that I got from him. And uh, his name featured and so be it. But sadly, some police are perhaps not overly enlightened these days and they may of course still be a bit nervous because of the Leveson inquiry and everything that came out of that they, they might be terrified of inappropriate relationships I don't want inappropriate relationships with anybody I just want a dialogue yeah I suppose yeah and given that as well actually talking about the the guy ringing you up the villain ringing you up and threatening you uh, let's go back to leaving the undercover um, touch on the book again in a moment but when you left um, the cops or well yeah. not left when you had to go into witness protection oh right okay so we'll rewind yep I was forward work. backwards yep yep sorry <laughs> <laughs> no. apologies for the lack of continuity here everybody. we're all good um, okay so I was at the peak of my powers as an undercover cop if a major drugs investigation came into Scotland Yard and it required an undercover cop the person at the top of the list that always got the call was me and um, and so I went off and performed a role in this operation with with a colleague which culminated in a huge uh, seizure uh, of heroin in a hotel down in Gatwick where I'd spent all afternoon testing these 30 bags of heroin and all of that uh, came out of the hotel room uh, with with one of the bad guys. We were going down to the bar to have a celebratory drink and all that kind of stuff to to uh, shake hands and celebrate the start of a great business relationship here. We're all going to make millions and all that kind <coughs> of stuff. So as I pressed the button for the lift and we we're waiting for the lift, next thing, pandemonium, armed police leap out of every hidden corner and nook and cranny you could imagine. Me and the bad guy get slammed to the ground, handcuffed, all that sort of stuff, dragged away. 
and uh, that bad guy and uh, others a day or two later appeared in court charged with a major drug conspiracy. And of course they looked around themselves in the dock and they've gone, where's that Larry South London bloke with a ponytail? He's not here. So needless to say, you didn't have to be Einstein to figure out that I was probably an undercover cop. And then they worked on the theory that if they killed me, they killed the evidence. And to an extent they had a point. Um, the plot to kill me was actually picked up on a FBI phone tap in a bar in Boston, Massachusetts, because this was a you know a global conspiracy yep. and, and involved different law enforcement agencies from around the world and all of that. Well, that was kind of okay because being threatened was part of the territory, and and all they knew was that you know I was a pony, a ponytail bloke, you know, from South London, so they wouldn't be able to actually get any details that could lead them to my front door. Um, but then, unfortunately, uh, a major report into the the investigation, all its complexities, all the challenges that it faced, all the difficulties that there were, um, was compiled by a, a detective. And that detective in this report put my full, proper name, which, as anybody watching this will know, is a rather distinctive surname. There's not a lot of Blexleys around. He did not put my number, you know, allocated to me by the undercover unit. He put my full name instead, right? So there's the kind of first almost unforgivable error that this officer made. Then we get to the uh, completely unforgivable bit. He takes a copy of this report out of his office it should never have left secure police premises, puts it in a bag in the back of a, an unmarked police car and apparently goes bloody shopping, right? During which his car gets broken into, right? And that report gets stolen. Was it random? Was it stolen to order? Had he been followed? Who it's knows? A bit too convenient. Right? <laughs> Who knows, right? But then what it meant when that theft was reported that I was potentially in grave danger because you marry up the threat to kill, the plot to kill me with the report detailing everything that I'd done and my real name in it, I'd be easy to find. So it was literally, I was driving home one night from work and I got a phone call, don't go home, you know, move into a hotel get your girlfriend to pack an overnight bag and be at the yard nine o'clock here the following morning. And that day I, I got there, not at nine o'clock, I got there at eight o'clock of course and my mate gave me a copy of the report. He said, you're going to need this as an insurance policy, mate. Right? So I took it, read it, couldn't believe it, couldn't believe it had my name and it, couldn't believe it had been stolen. Tucked it in my pocket and by the end of play that day it had been decided that I should abandon my home, abandon my identity, basically abandon my life and move into the witness protection program, which was the most miserable, dark period of my life. And with that, because just changing your life overnight and already having the stress of knowing someone is basically wanting your life. And how did that feel to you? Because that was when you said you were still doing undercover work. Yeah, at yeah. That point. Um, yeah. You then went uh, and actually started using drugs and alcohol yourself. Was that? pretty close to that time? Was it further along the, along the line? I, um, I, my involvement with drugs came after I'd retired. Okay. Um, basically, what happened was um, I literally got sort of parachuted into this strange neighbourhood, into this house that had to be renovated because it was unfit for me to live in. Um, I, as I say, changed my identity and all of that, but the police still expected me to work undercover. So on any given day, I'd wake up in the morning, come down to the front door, mate, pick up my mail, and that would be in the name that I was living in the witness protection program with. And I'd go, right, okay. So, you know, that's my first identity of the day, right? Get ready, go to work. In the car, maybe I could put on the radio and be myself for an hour when I drove to work. 
Then I'd get to work and then, believe it or not, they would go, there's another undercover operation coming, right? You're going to go and do it. I'd say, yeah, all right. So in any given day, I would be three different people, right? And um, needless to say, that took its toll. It was completely unsustainable. Nobody thought it out. Um, and it was just ludicrous to think that I could survive in such circumstances. And as I tried to deal with the ever-present threat to my life, the fear of the assassin's bullet, literally with virtually every waking move, um, yeah, I drank too much. And I smoked too much. And I, perhaps not surprisingly, had a huge catastrophic breakdown, which led to me spending three and a half weeks in a lock-in psychiatric ward. Can you remember what the drink was actually, what you thought the drink was going to be doing for you? Why were you drinking? Why were you taking the drugs? Yeah, because I'd, I'd, I'd get home from work, invariably another stressful day of working undercover. Um, I'd go straight to the fridge, that is if I hadn't had a drink after work. You know, and I'd go to the fridge and I'd get another beer out. Or maybe if I fancied it, you know, I might have a, a short or something. Um, and I'd put the telly on and I'd drink. I became a bit of a monster to my girlfriend, of course, because of all this constant pressure. And, um, you know, and I would sit there and just try and drink to forget everything that was going on because... I wasn't at home, I was in a hideout. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't like you were getting home and saying to yourself, oh, you deserve a glass after a long week at work or this, that and the other. It's the weekend, let's have a drink and relax. I, I couldn't relax. I was in a bloody hideout, you know, with alarm panels all the way up the stairs and by the front door and all that kind of stuff. You know, constant, constant reminders that I'm not in my home, I'm in a hideout. Um, and then I'd have a drink and I'd drink too much and I'd fall asleep on the sofa um, and I'd wake up at whatever hour it was in the middle of the night, stagger up to bed, grab a few hours, get up in the morning, um, get ready for work and, and leave that hideout hoping not to see any of my neighbours because I've always been quite a neighbourly bloke but neighbours are going to say, Oh, hello, and what's your name, and where have you moved from, and what do you do, right? And I don't want to answer any of those questions. And yet I'm a naturally neighbourly sort of bloke. I don't want to have any of those conversations because I've just got to layer lie upon lie upon lie upon lie just to blooming exist. Yeah. Then I get in the car, then I drive to work. Oh, and I'm going off to be some other character now. I'm going off to be, you know, undercover drugs baron from south london or contract killer you know and i'm flying here there and everywhere and driving here there and everywhere and having this constant constant pressure and this constant fear of an assassin's bullet every time i drive in to the you know back to the hideout you know i'm, I'm getting up in the morning i'm checking under the car every morning you know every time i drive in i'm driving very cautiously is someone hiding in the bushes is this going to be my last ever moment? You know, and this was constant. It's not surprising that it took its toll where you had all that stress, like the extreme stress levels, and you're trying to be two, three people, when in society nowadays, people struggle even just to be the one person that they are with social media and things, and they're resorting to stress levels. It's unsurprising that you resorted to the things you, you resorted to to essentially sedate that. Yeah, and coupled with the fact that that whole stuff about the report, having my name in, leaving the station, being stolen, all of that. You know, many people were coming up to me with conspiracy theories, not that I wasn't cooking up enough of my own in my head, you know, going, what's going on here? You know, none of this kind of makes any sense. You know, and coupled with the time, that period of policing, there was plenty of corruption going on in the Met. You know, the Met Commissioner was banging on about 200 corrupt detectives and all that kind of stuff, you know, and you're thinking, you know, my mind was just working overtime, 24 seven, you know, maybe I'd snatch a few hours sleep here and there, and I just kept it going and kept it going and kept it going, 
getting increasingly paranoid, hardly surprising, increasingly stressed, again, hardly surprising, and eventually burned to a cinder. And how did you start to pull yourself out of that hole? Through the wonders of the people of the NHS, purely and simply. Um, doctors, nurses, mental health workers, all of that. They're what fixed me eventually. I still have had other kind of not great periods in my life where yep. my mental health hasn't been wonderful. Because I think there's a there's a there's an indelible scar left there. You know, it triggered uh, some kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Fragility, perhaps. You know, which is why I still have to take a maintenance dose of medication to this day. Um, but I have no shame about that. I have no shame talking about my mental health issues. I think it's really important. Definitely. Um, and you know, I've 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 met some wonderful people that have treated me, got me well, kept me well. I still take my tablet before I go to bed at night, and 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 look, I'm I'm fine. I'm well. I'm happy. I have an incredibly fulfilling life. I write books. I'm that bloke on the telly. I've got a wonderful, wonderful family. And so to anybody who is experiencing a mental health issue or has done or may do in the future, what I can say is if you can get the therapy, get the counselling, listen to the professionals, take the bent if appropriate, then I would like to think I'm an example that there are much brighter days ahead. Yeah, I'm a massive believer in that because I've been open about anxiety, eating disorders and all that sort of stuff and talking about it just seems to help so much oh. and then taking the advice that professionals give you. Yeah, a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot. So yeah. you then, you were out of the force then after that breakdown, you brought yourself around with that, with, with the support of others and that's where you went into, that was Murphy's Law then, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, then. yeah. So yeah. you started being a Back in advisor the day. for BBC. Yeah, the wonderful Jimmy Nesbitt, that was, um, he played the role of an undercover cop from season three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, season one and season two, um, Jimmy had adopted a different role every week. Um, so it wasn't exactly anchored in reality, this show. Right, you know, one week he'd be a neurosurgeon, the next week he'd be a nun or something. I'm being a bit flippant, but, you know, it was that the, the kind of, um, yeah. And But it had worked for two seasons, but when the BBC recommissioned it for season, series three... I think the headline note they gave to the production company was, this show has got to change. Um, and one of the writers um, picked up on the gangbuster and read it and said, we've got to get this bloke on board. Um, so I went up to a meeting in Soho, sat at an oval table in a restaurant, surrounded by about 10 or 11 producers, directors, writers, execs, script editors and all that kind of stuff got a bit of a grilling, gave them far better than I got and um, and got hired. And we then had three series of it, which were uh, very successful. And just to prove what a baptism, baptism of fire it was into the bonkers world of television, series five got nominated for the best drama BAFTA and decommissioned in the same week. Ladies and gentlemen, the world of television for you. That is pretty crazy. Pretty crazy story. No doubt there were some conspiracy theories around that as well. <laughs> so, going on from there, um, how did Hunter then come about? Because there, there was playwriting and things like that for radio and different yeah. um, things. In, how did Hunter come about? Well, working with lots of writers on Murphy's Law, I kind of really got a yearning for writing, you know, as, you know beyond the gangbuster and stuff which is what led to me writing plays for Radio 4 and then on the run, you know, I'm still writing to this day, obviously. Um, but of course, I had, through my exposure from The Gangbuster, my name was out there and I've done a lot of commentary over the years on crime and policing and mm. how they impact on society and all that kind of stuff. So my name was out there. So when some very clever person at Shine TV came up with the idea of, can we film a manhunt? Um, and they then decided to sort of put that into development. 
and they were reaching out for potential people to um, crew the HQ and be the ground hunters, my name was already out there in connection to um, policing and, and that kind of stuff. So I was easy to find. I got a phone call. I went up and had a meeting with two delightful people um, and they shot a little taster tape of me answering a couple of questions, you know. And... Um, yeah, I got hired as a deputy in Series 1. Yeah, I was going to say, how did um become the leader in Series 2? Well, it was decided after Series 1 that there would be a new chief. And I put my hat into the ring and made it be known that I was... I would like to be considered for that role. And I got it. Yeah. And here we are having now done three series of the main show, two celebrity versions, and series four going to air in January. That's pretty epic to, to say the least. And I think as well, I think the first season, like just noticing it from, from a fan point of view, where the people who were being hunted, they really probably felt they were more criminals. And when they actually got caught, they were like, get your hands off me and everything. But then on the other ones, it was just like more gutted. They're just... Like we've been caught and people's opinions of it and how now though have you seen the, the public when the fan base grows have you found it easier to get support from the public when hunting people down um, well you know we don't we don't put out public appeals on day one no um, because essentially it, it's you know the, the show isn't crime watch Um and we, as investigators, would like to catch the fugitives through smart, bright, and intelligence in, uh, in intelligent detective work. Um, if there comes a stage during the hunt that we think it is appropriate and we're allowed, then we may do a social media appeal. But if you count up over the series, um, I don't suppose we've directly captured that many fugitives as a result of of public information. It's very welcome, and I love the public that do it, and I'm only too happy to reward people. Um, but essentially, when we do do it, invariably we do it through a social media release video, or something like that, so we try and weave a bit of humour into Still it. And, teddy bear. and, you know... Borrow their teddy Borrow bear. Borrow their teddy bear. Borrow their hostage. teddy bear and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So with that, we've hunted. Uh, looking at from the history in, in the police force of Scotland Yard and hunted, what is the biggest lesson on leadership you've learned along the way? Um, get out of the way and let people do their thing. Okay? If people have been recruited and employed because they're good at what they do, then why on earth would you want to get in the way and start stopping them doing what they do? Particularly on Hunted, my leadership, obviously I have to strategize. Yep. And a lot of those big strategy decisions are for me to make ultimately. Ultimately, there has to be a decision maker. Um, I do tend to lead by committee in many regards. I love to I love to countenance the view of everybody and I say to everybody in HQ and the ground hunters, the twenty nine of us, you've all got a voice and I want to hear that voice because I most certainly do not have a monopoly on the on good ideas. In fact, as I often say to everybody in HQ, the thickest bloke in the room is in charge. Right? And that's true because they've all got degrees and masters and they're doing doctorates and they're astonishingly bright people. And yet the oik from South London is in charge. But that's how it goes. Um, so I countenance everybody's view. I want to hear everybody's voice. And so much, yes, I just get out the way. I keep a watch in brief. But there's no point cluttering up the processes and just getting in the way for the sake of it. I like that, I like that. A couple final questions uh, to finish off here. One celebrity that you'd love to catch on Hunted? Um, 
a celebrity that I would love to catch on Hunted? Well, I think I know who the public would like to see us hunt down in a celebrity version. And that would be one of the high profile former military guys. There always seems to be a bit of a clamouring for that yes, on yes. social Who media. Does? Yeah, all those kind of, all those kind of guys. But at the end, we of had the that day, question on the way up here. It's like, well, who would win? Who does SAS? Who does wins? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 It'd be us, of course. Um, we we but, uh, may have had different views, but then yeah, I do I'm want to sure. get I do want to get Ant Middleton and Foxy on the podcast at some I'm point. Sure. So I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> well, I've just thrown down the gauntlet, now, haven't I? But it, yep. it's a decision made way above my pay grades, and I have no influence over. One that. of my clients has um, is mates with Ant Middleton, so I'll, right. I'll get him to have a look at it. I'm sure yeah. we've got links. But anyway, other than that, apart from that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was no, I, I'm the look. All those kind of decisions are made by the production company. They always seem to get a, a wonderful, diverse group of celebs to volunteer, as they do with people in the main series. They always seem to be, they must be very creative in their recruiting processes. And at the end of the day, we'll just try and catch whoever's put in front of us. And would any of the hunted team be able to out-hunt the hunters? Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. the word? They, they would never catch me. Okay, uh, and I would think they probably wouldn't catch most of us because the biggest word of advice I can ever give to anybody if the show gets recommissioned and you're considering applying for it for any future series, if there are more, the biggest advice I can give is be nice to people. Mm -hmm. If you're nice to people, They'll feed you, they'll clothe you, they'll give you a bed for the night, they'll give you transport, they will look after you. So just be nice to people. That is a good one. And finally, in your own words, well, all this has been in your own words anyway, but what does energy, focus and performance mean for you right now? Uh, writing. Yep. Researching, um, researching and writing about unsolved murders because I'm passionate about what I do. I believe firmly that those who commit murder, of course, deserve to be where they should be, which is behind bars. Unfortunately, we have an increasing murder rate and a dropping conviction rate, which means more people are committing murder and getting away with it. Um, please forgive me for the unashamed plug. You know, my latest book, To Catch a Killer, which is about the unsolved murder of Alistair Wilson, led to me being called to Parliament last week. I saw that on Twitter, actually. Yeah. Um, people are saying very flattering things about the book. It's important. I, wanna, I, I do it because I want to catch a killer. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm driven to that. It's what I do, and it all revolves around the one word... That, that I would advise anybody who wants to get the most out of life and enjoy what they do, it's commitment. Oh, yeah. Commitment. If you are committed to every task, every day, you're going to have a good time. That's a big, honest, honest thing there. So, um, The book, I'm not just saying this because I'm sitting here in your living room, but I'm a slow reader. I don't know whether that's being from Norfolk or something like that, and I'm better at driving tractors, but I'm a slow reader, and usually it takes me probably about a month to read a Lee Charles Jack Reacher book and I'm a massive fan of them but that took like two or three days and at first you think what's about an unsolved murder why am I going to read it knowing that it's still unsolved but it made you go on through the chapters and then now you actually think I really hope they get this person and so thanks for writing that and thanks Thank for you. coming on the show Thank it's you a pleasure Lovely to have met you Thank you